As a starting point, uh, I just want to point out that parts of America have been convulsed by riots over the last week, which were occasioned by protests, which were in turn triggered by the disturbing death of George Floyd at the hands of an officer with a history of excessive force complaints. Um, Even if we reject violence as we should, we can't help wondering if complaints about police misconduct actually may have a real basis. We'll explore that today and what can be done about it in today's Lighthouse Briefing from the Independent Institute. Today we're going to be helped in our quest by uh, one of our longtime friends, Dr. Samuel Staley from Florida State University. Welcome, Dr. Staley. Oh, thank you for having me um, on this call. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great opportunity. It's wonderful to be to have you with us. Um, Dr. Samuel Staley um, is one of our research fellows affiliated with the Independent Institute. Um, he is also the director of the, the DeVoe L. Moore Center at Florida State, and he is a film critic. Um, one of his recent books is called Contemporary Film and Economics, which is a pretty fascinating subject. He often writes film commentary for us, and you'll find him on our blog, uh, blog.independent.org, which we call The Beacon. <clears throat> And uh, so we're so grateful to have you um, with us today, Dr. Samuel Staley. So let's take a look at this issue, Sam. Um, You know, the protests have been pretty pretty incredible. There's been violence. There's been looting. There's been destruction. Uh, The protests, which seemed to go before the riots, um, were probably justified. The violent riots, I I can't find a way to justify. But as I say, um, the protests in themselves seem to have some pretty good questions that they're posing to us. And so we are going to explore some of this. Um, Thank you for working so hard on this subject over the years. Most recently, um, Sam has published a great article on our Beacon uh, website, which is called George Floyd and the Future of Police Misconduct. I encourage you to find that on our website, uh, thebeacon at independent.org. We, um, looking through that article, uh, Sam, I, I noticed that you've done a lot of thinking about this. And so let me just begin by asking you, uh, isn't it the case that Minneapolis was one of the most progressive police departments in the nation? So why did this happen there, and why has it triggered such a reaction? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure we'll be able to fully answer the question until after we can do some postmortems on these events. But no, Minneapolis actually was one of the more progressive um, departments. And I think especially for those of us that come from more of a libertarian or a conservative perspective, I think it's important to differentiate between what what progressive, what that means. In terms of that in Minneapolis started to address racism and and questions of ethnicity and how they're actually deploying their tools into the community, they were doing a lot of forward thinking on that. Um, they were also, though, that now I think that's a, a good element of progressivism because I think we always need to be reflecting mm-hmm. on how we're treating other people and whether we're treating people with the dignity that they deserve as human Absolutely. beings. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There's the other part of progressivism, too, which is not necessarily as good, which they are still struggling with. That is where you have a police union, which has this very important focus, protecting jobs at any cost, even when they run contrary to policy. And there's a great quote, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal from the police chief that got canned before, this current police chief, where she mm -hmm. talks about how the, she talks about entrenchment of interests and how difficult it is to have reform. My interpretation of that is the union. Um, because it mm-hmm. made accountability so difficult within the uh, within the department itself. So yeah, it was um, definitely doing some things that a lot of other I think we should have been looking looking at and making it more humane, um, mm-hmm. but on sort of recognizing it. Um, I don't think they were pulling back on the actual crime part of it, but they were beginning to ask themselves. Are we actually, is, is pulling someone out of a car, handcuffing them, mm. and then throwing them to the ground because they are, um, they, may, they may be passing a forged bill. Is that the right level of force? Um, so they were beginning to have those conversations. Right. So maybe in a way, it's not fair to say that somehow Minneapolis was uniquely uh, a tinderbox, a uniquely... Uh, Sorts of problems. Maybe they were partaking of you know errors uh, that were widespread, I and mean, it just happened that there was this one triggering event. Um, you know, with, without getting into the uh, 
specifics of exactly what happened with Officer Chauvin and George Floyd and so forth, which I don't think we're in a position to adjudicate here uh, in this call. There's a background <clears throat> that I, I learned about partly from you um, where, in fact, there's a history not even needing to go back as far, you know, as the Civil War and the pre-Civil War uh, South. There is a background of a kind of racist overtone and a number of public safety, policing kinds of functions that goes back to what you call uh, the United States 140-year progressive war on drugs. Can you comment on what you meant by that? Yeah. I found that a little bit disturbing and also maybe illuminating. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's really interesting. And in my first book, um, way back when I was, well, you know, oh, but now I think it's 25 years ago, my first book was actually on the drug war. And it's, I think it was the first book length treatment of looking at what the drug war's impact on cities and neighborhoods what, um, was doing. And part of that research, I started really you know, diving into what's the history behind our war on drugs. And it was really striking and disturbing. Most of our major drug laws have come around or have been supported and propelled in the public mind by using racial stereotypes and tropes. Um, and also you can see it in how the laws themselves are crafted. Mm -hmm. So it starts with opium in the end of the 19th century. And it was an anti, the anti-Chinese imagery is really stunning. And they went after the opium dens, but they didn't really focus on users because users were Americans um, as uh, opposed yeah. to Chinese. Then mm -hmm. in the 30s, it was the, um, the stereotype of the Mexican who can't handle marijuana. And marijuana was gonna incite them to violence against white women. And then cocaine, we found the same thing. So by the time, Richard Nixon comes around in the mm -hmm. in late 60s and 1970 to really start to clamp down on the supply side of marijuana. These, this racial history is very well embedded in the entire structure and conversation about drugs. And then it was the term war on drugs came with uh, um, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And the interesting thing is that when we look at our current problems with corrections and criminal justice reform, the real impacts begin to take off in the 1980s. And mm -hmm. man, that it is stunning and striking when we look at it. And then looking at the racial overtones that are part of it, mm -hmm. as well as the impacts in certain type communities, poor and, and wealthy. I mean, you wonder, looking back, <clears throat> There were very reason, legitimate reasons to be concerned about, obviously, all the drugs you just mentioned, you know, marijuana at the least, I guess, but all the others and cocaine. Why in the world did people feel they needed to get the leverage of racial stereotyping to enact the policies and controls they wanted? Why, why go there? Why not just talk yeah. about the intrinsic harm to everybody? Well, because the advocates of the laws needed to get um, public support. And the reality is mm. most people aren't using the drugs. So most people, the drug use and the effects are not part of their lived experience. Right. It does not translate into the ballot box. So, but on the other hand, if you elevate that issue to one where if a Mexican is going to be hyped up on marijuana, now they're going to go after white women and others mm -hmm. because of that, that violence that's intrinsic to it. And you work on the stereotype, which is, it has built in prejudice, it becomes a lot easier to actually move legislation at that point. So it's so if very, you're looking for political leverage in that context, you go to this bad place, basically. And then, not surprisingly, African American citizens and others notice the motifs being used <clears throat> and it poisons the atmosphere, right? Absolutely. And it's um it's in it's more than poisoning, and I think where what my learning, if you will, that has been most dramatic over the last 10 years has been understanding how policing has affected different groups within society differentially. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, so I, I look at these now, and the protests were something I think I was really taken aback by in the sense that you know, we've been through this before. As an urban mm -hmm. policy guy, we've protests and violence and riots are not new. Mm -hmm. So, but I wasn't sure they were actually going to take hold. But is, there's no doubt that these protests are 
are really connecting at a very deep level, not just in minority communities, but also in um, certain parts of white communities. And there's broad-based support for the protests, not for the violence. There definitely no. is not for the violence. Right. Well, let, I, I want to come back to the issue of the protests and how they are historically significant and so forth. Um, a few more concrete details I'm going to pull out of your piece first before we go back to that very important point. Some of the specific um, misconduct or uh, sort of policy errors that you identify has to do with prosecutorial excess, and by which I think I understand that there is a practice of <clears throat> overcharging. Absolutely. Um, and so when you overcharge, you, you, you lay out too many charges, and people with few resources feel overwhelmed by having tw 20, 13, 17 counts lodged against them, and then they are bullied into plea bargaining. Is that right? Absolutely. And this is well documented at this point. And this is another consequence of the war on drugs, by the way. John Pfaff at Fordham University has done probably the most comprehensive work on this. And if you think about it, and actually our economic lens, if you under if we if you have a good chance to understand public choice economics and institutions, mm -hmm. actually and organizational behavior, which is I, I know quite a bit about as well, it actually makes sense that the logic behind it, in the sense that imagine if instead of being faced with one count of felony forgery of a $20 bill, which is probably mm -hmm. relatively minor, right. unless you're actually manufacturing it, now you're faced with disorderly conduct. You're faced with um, not only forgery, now they're also going to charge you because they think since you have the bill, you must be manufacturing the bill. So now they're gonna charge you also with the manufacturing of forgery. And mm. this begins to accumulate. If you don't have the resources and you're relying on a public defender who's already overwhelmed with cases, it looks pretty daunting. And you may be willing to say, you know what, I'll take, I'll mm -hmm. take two or three years on the passing a forged bill rather than running the risk of 20 years mm -hmm. uh, with a jury. That's probably not going to be favorable toward me anyway because I'm a black male with an erratic mm -hmm. um, employment mm -hmm. history. So this, this prosecutorial practice, it's not intrinsically racist. Uh, what it is is intrinsically unjust. Uh, yes. And anybody with lack of resources is going to be cowed by this. And for background reasons, that happens to be a correlation to some degree between those with lesser resources and those in racial and ethnic minority communities. And so it, it ends yes. up having a racist kind of impact, even though the, the foolishness of it, is, it has nothing to do pr intrinsically with race. Right. And I think what really the unifying part of what of this, the aftermath of these protests can be, is going back to this notion that people ought to be treated fairly based on who they are, not mm -hmm. what category they're in. Um, and, what, and the complicating part of what we're dealing with now is that there is racism that combines with the unjustness right. that comes with this. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, there's a sociologist at the University of Maryland, um, Ray, uh, Rashawn Ray, African-American male, 40 years old, tenured, never had an arrest record, does not have any arrest record. He has been, he's 40 years old, he has been pulled over or harassed by the police more than 40 times. Wow. I am 59 years old, a white male. I have been pulled over, I could count them, seven. Actually, no, I'm sorry, nine. Nine times, there must be something wrong with you, buddy. I know. And so the thing is, you know, it's one, and I've had, I've been pulled over for things that have just been stupid and ridiculous. In one case, that is, was completely unjustified, but I'm not going to push the envelope on somebody with a gun um, and is, is already irritated at me because they pulled mm -hmm. me over. Imagine, if, but I then began thinking, what if that's happened to me 40 times? Yeah. It's a very different world in which you work in. Another angle that you discuss uh, in the paper has to do with um, police unions. And of course, there's a lot of comment about this uh, for a long time. There's been for you know several decades quite a kind of alliance between elected officials and unions of all type, especially including police unions. I was stunned to learn the ways in which um, police contracts, which were you know insisted upon by their unions, uh, contain all sorts of ways in which police officers' records are concealed and they are shielded. They're given a leg up uh, against any possible accusation. If they have a history of uh, bad conduct, it is, has often been erased due to union contracts. Why do the unions want to create a system where 
bad behavior can be so easily concealed, which means that there are going to be bad apples who tend uh, to populate police departments. And if people are bad apples, whether racist or not, they're going to end up doing bad things. Why do the unions do this? Well, it's interesting because at the end of the day, a union's a union, um, one way or the other. They exist solely for the purpose of protecting their members. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of work on education reform. And, you know, one of the things you find is that, you know, the union's not there to protect the kids. They're there to protect their members and their teachers very often. The same, that, I mean, that's one element of it. In the police unions, that's more so. And part of it is this, and I think this is a turning point that these protests are going to bring to the table that we need to take advantage of. They're beginning to realize that th if they continue to harbor bad apples or actually allow them to continue to rot and mm -hmm. then add more and more to the barrel, that they're right. done. They're going to be, mm -hmm. no one's going to put up with it. We have mm -hmm. the ability to ally with minority communities now on this issue. Perspect actually have several, um, uh, several people in minority communities have said, you know, I'm not ready to get rid of all unions, but police unions, yes, I'm ready to do this. Okay, and, good, good step. <laughs> yeah, and it makes sense. And, and the thing is, this is the problem. First of all, with the police unions, they have not only the legit legitimate use of force of the state, they have the equipment to act on that. And the rules right now are so loose that any cop in any situation almost could say, well, that was the force I thought I needed to use in order to save myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I talk about in my article is that we should have a minimum force standard with police force. The question should be not if you used appropriate force. The mm -hmm. question is, did you use the minimum force necessary to accomplish your goal? And mm -hmm. that shifts the focus dramatically at that point. Right now we have a union structure at the local level that is spending a lot of time just preserving the jobs of the people that are its members, which is a mm -hmm. natural incentive. Um, we have to recognize that that's one of these institutional right. components of this problem that has to be addressed. You know, what's, what's again, like the other case we were talking about, uh, the interest of unions to protect their members and basically shield them from accountability as much as possible and maximize their opportunity to uh, be secure in their jobs. <clears throat> that problem is not a racist problem, but unfortunately it has the effect of letting maybe maladjusted, abusive, bully type personalities tend to congregate under the shelter of these union regulations and stipulations. And those kind of people may in fact tend to have some racist overtones in their behavior. Yeah. The system isn't racist, it's just unjust, but it has racial results. Yeah, I think that, and that's part of what the discussion over the next couple months is gonna be trying to tease out. If you're a minority in the US, it's really hard to distinguish between those two. Um, yeah, for the right. reasons I just talked about, right? And they're the right. ones who are defining, have been put this, has put this issue onto the front burner. Now the, we got to figure out, well, how much of this is real racism? How much of this is just an unjust system? Is an unjust system right. gone run amok? And now I am of the opinion that there's a lot more racism than we're willing to admit that's going on. But that racism is harbored by this unjust system and it compounds the effects. Right. In other words, um, let's just assume for now, uh, we, in taking your points earlier, that we don't know all the details about what happened in Minneapolis and with Chauvin. What was striking to me is that no one around Chauvin felt they could intervene in a case where he could have preserved his life. Yeah. And what happens is at that point is that you can operate and act on biases without consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the problem, right? Right, right. It's the systematic blocking of consequences and accountability is the problem. Right, and the truth is, you know, I've also gotten quite an education having moved to the South after being in the Midwest for most of my life. Um, but this is true, you're never going to get rid of all bad behavior and you're never gonna be able right. to get rid of all racists. The question is, do we create the social institutions and political institutions and legal institutions that can contain that behavior most effectively? When mm -hmm. you shield it, it goes wild. Um, right, talk about shielding. Shielding uh, is also exacerbated by the Supreme Court's doctrine of qualified immunity developed back in the 60s. 
uh, by which uh, agents of the government partake to some great degree in the sovereign immunity of the government and they can't be sued, which is a, a very systematic way of protecting bad behavior uh, if police officers and many other uh, agents of the state were in fact personally accountable and could be held liable in civil action, for instance, uh, for damages, think of the incentives for care, caution, prudence, restraint that that would induce. But if you give them qualified immunity, you take away all the incentives for caution, prudence, and restraint. That's kind of scary. Yeah, no, it is scary. And we're seeing cases over and over and over again where um, people have seen, well, police officers have exceeded their authority without having to worry about consequences. Right. And again, um, we have to give credit to the protesters, which are now over 100 cities, because they've been talking about Minneapolis and Baton Rouge, and they've been talking about all these other places where this has been happening to raise awareness for this. And so I do believe qualify, uh, getting rid of this immunity is an important part of the puzzle in how we solve this. Can that be done legislatively, or does the Supreme Court have to change its mind? Yeah, so, there, so that's, that's the issue. The Supreme Court has to change its mind. It's a doctrine that was created by the Supreme Court. Now, the mm -hmm. one thing that gives us a little more scope now than we may not have had uh, 10 years ago is that we have a majority on the Supreme Court that is more deferential to legislative solutions than right. previous. So right. it very well could be we have some legislative solutions that can address this, and the default of a majority right now will be with the spirit and the intent behind that legislation. So there's right. more scope for this. Right. Um, I just want to mention on this subject of, of qualified immunity, um, the Independent Institute has for some years been developing uh, resources on this and related subjects. So be back behind my right shoulder, I think I've got a copy of a book, uh, To Serve and Protect, published a few years ago, which is highly relevant to this discussion. Um, it explores uh, private and community policing. Um, in other words, um, examining both the practice and the prospect of uh, non-governmental policing done by private associations and communities, those people don't partake of qualified immunity. They are very liable for what they do, uh, and it really change, it, it does and would change the incentives. Um, if we took seriously that book to serve and protect, I encourage everybody to take, take a peek at that. So uh, let's go back, um, Sam, to the one thing where we left off that I kind of stopped you where you wanted to go a minute ago, and that is you were trying to compare what's going on here with these protests and, and riots and so forth, with earlier rounds of this kind of thing in, in the you know, 20th century, um, Rodney after Rodney King, and then more recently in Ferguson. Is this the same kind of phenomenon? Is it different? Uh, does it help to compare? Um, I think it's different. And there are a couple reasons why it's different, um, at least from what I've been able to observe, um, not only sitting in Tallahassee, but looking at elsewhere. One is it's very clear that there is a much broader um, interest in this. In other words, we're seeing the protests themselves are more diverse, both racially and ethnically, but also in terms of socioeconomics. So we're having a lot of people taking to the streets that were not necessarily in the streets on many of these other protests. The more important thing, though, is technology and how it's uh, been able to translate mm -hmm. all of this into one space, but more, not only that, every, uh, I was just talking to some of my students about this yesterday. Everybody has been stuck in their apartment, in their house for three months, mm -hmm. watching the internet. And suddenly they are aware in a way that few generations would have been aware unless you're watching the nightly news among your three broadcast affiliates, or four maybe, of what was happening, and often it's in real time. So there is a right. level That's of- That's a big a, difference. It is a huge difference. And so mm -hmm. COVID-19 has helped translate this event in Minneapolis to a level that we simply didn't see with, in Ferguson even, although Ferguson was pretty significant at that point. Um, so the protests, I think, are of a different caliber and level. It's unclear where we're going to end up at the end of this, um, mm -hmm. and as I told my students, you know, I've been through this before, so part of what I've been doing is trying to see whether or not there's some legs, but we're now, you know, almost, what, two weeks into protests that have been yeah. sustained in a lot of cities. So that's, that's non-trivial. 
Non-trivial. Uh, I, I've got a, a, one of our friends in Oklahoma is uh, wanting to ask you a question. Go ahead, friend. Oh, Graham, this is Roger. Hey, Roger. Um, I was interested in how it seems the protests have escalated from a concern about pro pro excuse me, police brutality into some more violent and righteous uh, demands on other issues and becoming, uh, uh, well, to the point where you have an occupation of part of Seattle at this point. Right. Right. And then also, how does this uh, couple with this being sort of a global issue where it's, it's occurring not only in the States, but in Europe, uh, South America, and other parts of the world? Yeah, those are great questions. And I think those are some of the things I've been personally looking at more in a lot more depth in the last week. Um, honestly, I'm not putting a lot of attention into the international component because I just don't think that's going to impact domestic policy very much. And I think that's triggering a bunch of other kinds of conversations that are unique to those nations and those cultures and the politics there. However, on the violence, um, I don't think it's, at least from where I'm sitting, the violence is not necessarily a linear additive component to the protests. One of the things we've seen in a lot of different cities is the protesters have been trying to stop the violence, but they don't have actually much ability to do that. And there's a fair amount of research now that shows that urban unrest itself has a very different foundation than protests. So protests themselves don't result in violence. The real question is, when do those, when does the violence happen and who, who, and who's behind it? Protests tend to be organized. Um, they tend to have specific objectives in mind and their primary goal is to raise awareness and they're planned. Urban unrest is not planned, um, at least in the scale that we've been seeing. They're basically opportunists and thugs who are taking advantage mm. of the situation and exploiting it, which is what we expect people to do. Now, the other part uh, that you raised, which I think is interesting, is we, we, there are definitely some very old school leftists that are part of this. Mm -hmm. And they are definitely, they're the ones who are seizing the police precincts. Um, I think we can look at that and know it and be pretty safe in thinking that that's not gonna go very far. Um, because they haven't in the past, they do not have a, they do, are not tapping into a groundswell of support. Um, they tend to be very niche, very focused. And in fact, I think even the Seattle Marxists are now taxing businesses and others and forcing them to support their efforts. So we see the left kind of descending or degenerating into their traditional tactics and they've never been able to generate broad support because of that. And I, for me, it's been gratifying to see the protesters actively engage in trying to prevent violence as much as they could without themselves being seriously put at risk. And unfortunately, some people defending their own property have actually been attacked and killed as part of this. And, um, but I think that is galvanizing people against violence, even those within the protest movement. I've got uh, Sally on the line from Massachusetts. Sally, you wanna raise your question? Yes, I'm interested in your comments on defund the police. I don't know what to make of it at all. And it's just this whole concept, defunding the police. Do you think that, what does it mean? I mean, wh wh yeah. where's this going? Yeah, that is a great question, Sally, and I'm so glad you raised that. The, um, the, so we have to remember that protests and the slogans on the signs and the chants are just that, slogans and, and, and really general um, concepts. They are, they are really, they're rallying points. They are not real policy proposals. So defund the police, that's one thing to think is what, so the question really is what, not so much literally defunding the police, but really what is behind that? And I'll tell you, it's one of those things that as you begin to unwrap it, and you begin to understand the full history behind policing in America, there's more to it than you might think. Um, the professional police force that we now know and take for granted is really a product of the 60s and 70s and 80s. If we look at the long history of police, then we're seeing that actually it was a machine, a political machine run by political people, and it actually had the consequences of that um, play out 
in neighborhoods and that type of thing. So to some extent, this is rooted in that old legacy history. The other part of it is what's really behind this is let's think differently about policing. That's what they're really saying, is that the militarization of police, the, ex the um, excessive use of force and violence, using these tactics of overwhelming force rather than de-escalation and engagement on a more personal level are, are not working and they're not just and they're not fair. So the defunding the police is really talking about how do we do policing differently? And part of that is to no longer fund SWAT teams um, or as many SWAT teams or at the same level mm -hmm. and no longer take the guns from the feds of assault weapons and having what happened in Kentucky, which is an, an, a plainclothes police with all sorts of military gear um, executing a warrant on the wrong apartment and killing innocent people. So it does. it is going to come through with some shifting in funding. That's definitely part of it. And there have been some cases where police departments have been um, de decommissioned or de disincorporated. And well, like, for to instance, Sam, I'm thinking of that case in Camden, uh, mm -hmm. uh, New Jersey, about seven years ago. In order to get out from under the police uh, union contract, they had to, legally speaking, decommission, e eliminate the existence of the prior police department and recreate a new one which did not have the union contracts so they could hire more police officers and not be bound by some of those dangerous rules. That was a form of defunding the police. But it, some people well, think it means don't have any police. Right, right. Which, which it can mean. Some people do mean that. Some people are really, you know, ideological or foolish. For others, they don't know what they mean. And for others, they mean it in this more fine-grained way that you mean it. It's right. complicated. So we just have to get to specifics to, to right. know what we're really talking about here. I've Absolutely. got a question yeah. from uh, John, who I've just uh, opened up his mic. If you'll unmute yourself, John, you can ask your question to Sam Staley. Hi. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, just like to get at the issue of systemic issues versus a, a, the rogue cop issue. And I keep hearing references to Ferguson. And Ferguson strikes me as an example of more of a systemic situation, because as I understand it, that, that police shooting was actually reasonably justified. But the issue with Ferguson was civil asset forfeiture was out of control in that town. And the, uh, the community was abused by that. And that was probably the underlying frustration. I was just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on, on how, if we go forward with the ending of uh, qualified immunity, how, how we start drawing the line properly so that, uh, you know, cops aren't overly intimidated, but at the same time, this kind of abusive behavior uh, makes right. them held accountable. Yeah, yeah. great question. And um, part of the problem is we've been under a system so for so long where no one is, uh, very few people have been accountable. Actually, I would even go so far to say that the cases where there is accountability are so rare, they don't even mean anything. We have to resort this and we have to figure out what those rules are. I can say, by the way, as a martial artist, that I am under certain rules about how I behave in public and how I respond to events around me. I can be held liable for an excessive use of force because of the skills I have learned about how to defend myself as a black belt. So that actually gives me, I'm, I should be better, uh, since I'm better trained, I should be able to use that um, knowledge more effectively. I think um, the other point you were raising, which I also, I, I wanna just reemphasize that, again, it's important in protest not to take the slogans too literally. Very often, there's actually uh, now a, an entire literature about how you have difficult conversations. In other words, what happens when you have a lot of conflict? This is all part of de-escalation. It's a part of understanding and getting to root problems. And one of the most important rules is whatever you're complaining about is not what you really care about. In other words, that's it's, confusing. Uh, it is confusing. <laughs> and so, the, but the point is, protests are very emotional. They're very much about projecting frustration, anger, that, and that then carries over into very specific things like defund police or you know kill the cops or whatever it might be. What's going on underneath are these bigger triggers. Um, people worried about is my car, if my son was smoking a joint in my car, they're seizing my car now, and now I can't get to work and I can't support my family. Um, that they might see. So there are a lot of other things that are in play at this point, which is why 
and this is something I've been really looking at pretty hard on, at for the last several years, is, is the trigger for the event the real problem? And it really isn't. And I think that's the case in the George Floyd um, uh, case too. The, the tri most of the events that are happening, I can even speak to Tallahassee, where we've had nine days of protests. It's not the same literal problem, even though they're using the rhetoric of mm. police brutality. There are other systemic issues that they're trying to address and bring to awareness. And unfortunately, as long as we're protesting, these conversations can't happen because it's too emotional. Um, but as the protests dissipate, as they become less a uh, big part of our everyday life, those conversations will happen. In Tallahassee, they are happening right now. Um, oh, we've got, I think, a question again from Roger. I've just opened up your mic, Roger. If you're still there and you want to ask your question, we'll give you the last question this morning. I'm not sure if Roger is still wanting to ask his question. It's Angela. Number one, I'm concerned that the violent protesters are organized or you wouldn't see the, the stacks of bricks on the street and you, and you wouldn't know about Antifa, which is very well organized and paying people to do these things. Number two, I'm concerned about the overwhelming idea that is being taught in our universities and some high schools that we are a racist and a guilty country. They are not teaching the entire story of slavery. They're not looking at the world history of slavery just in the United States. The Project 1619 is an example of that. And so I feel as though mm -hmm. a lot of people are learning to hate our country because they have half truths instead of whole truths. And yeah, six, that 1619 thing is an ideological hatchet job. Oh, yeah. it's horrible. But the, and the third thing I'll just mention is, have you heard of Coleman Hughes? And he is a very, very young, brilliant black man. And his latest uh, uh, podcast uh, is outstanding on these subjects. That's it. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, so actually, uh, Coleman Hughes, I've not heard of him. Actually, I probably have, but I will look him up after this and actually start looking more into that. Um, on the racism component of it, I, I frankly think that's a uh, much longer conversation than I think we're going to be able to have here. Um, I, my views have changed quite a bit on this. Um, yeah, by the way, I will. I agree completely with Graham. The 1619 thing is a, it's, it's a political movement. It is does it has. Uh, it, it, the, and I am concerned, Angela, with the things you're talking about, how we're teaching it in, in this type of thing. However, um, let me address the organization of the violence. And I think there, there are typically different stages in which violence manifests itself when we're talking about these kinds of events. The initial violence, so we have the, we have the protest. And then the, the, the initial violence, which is a lot of the looting that happens early on, is unorganized. And there are actually several, it, it's spontaneous, it's opportunistic, and, and that's, that's an element of it. And actually, love to provide, so there's actually a great, um, uh, uh, actually a very lengthy treatment of this on urban violence and unrest and the use of the military, which goes into this. Um, but then the other part which you're talking about, which is very disturbing and which we can't ignore, and I'm glad you brought this up, is that once the violence starts, then the violent people take advantage of it, and then they do a lot of destruction and damage, and that's intentional. And that's the, the benefit of that is once it becomes organized, we can do something about it. Um, it's very hard when it's spontaneous and it blows up all at once because of resources and availability and anticipation. All the reasons we know that, that just make it hard for anyone to concentrate resources. Once they get organized, then we can start doing something about it. That's when we've been seeing the grip bricks on the, on the ground. But um, very rarely is Antifa putting, I mean, and I know Antifa very well, I'm on campus, I've actually, I'm a faculty advisor to a number of conservative groups. We've actually had to deal with Antifa and various component, components of wow. that, so I'm very familiar mm. with it. Uh, Florida State, by the way, is a very safe place. We have a great ecosystem of conservative and libertarian um, students, about 1,200 of them self-identify in this space, which we work with on a regular basis. Um, but Antifa, what happens is those, the, the Antifa, the organized protesters, unlike the 60s, 
in the 70s where a lot of this violence was an organized attempt to overthrow the country. There was really a sense of revolution and you had these really substantial cells that were being developed. Today, it's much less organized, but it is opportunistic. And then we're looking at very short windows. So in other words, they know that the violence is only gonna happen three or four years, so let's maximize the violence, or three or four mm. days. Let's right. maximize the, the damage in three or four days. And so it's different, And I, but it, it really does require us to sort of recognize that we need different solutions to different parts of the problem. Right, and you know, <clears throat> I think that um, <clears throat> my friend Angela um, uh, is, quite right to, to draw our attention to the fact that uh, <clears throat> there are large, uh, you know, swaths of ideological opportunists who really uh, want to take the occasion of these widespread protests, which are about some <clears throat> very justifiable concerns. Uh, some of them are sort of systematic bad policies, and they want to transpose that into another and higher key and make it all about the systemic evil of the United States as a constitutional republic. Um, I am reminded, for example, looking back historically into the pre-Civil War period, uh, when we had the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass and the other leading abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. Now, uh, Garrison would hold these horrible rallies uh, against slavery at which he would burn copies of the U.S. Constitution, calling it a pact with the devil. Uh, whereas Frederick Douglass um, was the one who argued that the U.S. Constitution, in fact, had fundamental principles that were good from the beginning, needed to be more completely fulfilled. Uh, he saw the road to uh, empowerment and justice through fidelity to the Constitution and to America's principles, Garrison the opposite. Thankfully, uh, Frederick Douglass was more persuasive than William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, although Garrison, I think, may be responsible for some violence, which was uh, you know, beyond the necessary. And also, thankfully, Martin Luther King Jr. seemed to be taking more, much more of a page from Frederick Douglass than he took from William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., at his best, always called Americans to be faithful to their own founding principles and was not the kind of ideological opportunist that we see creating reenactments of the Paris Commune on the streets of Seattle. <laughs> so... <laughs> May America hold on to its balance, um, not be caught off guard by overreacting to slogans and to a minority of ideological thugs, and listen instead maybe to some prudent experts like Dr. Samuel Staley. So we thank you. We thank you for being with us. Thank you. I do think we're at, right now we're in a moment in our current history where we need to be very vig vigilant and making sure principles of individual dignity, freedom, and justice, and civil liberty, as we know it in terms of how it's enshrined in our Constitution, remain in the forefront of these discussions. Mm -hmm. We do, we are at serious risk of having that being drowned out. And I'm not worried about so much the Antifa, I'm worried about the more traditional left and the more liberals who are using this to try and triangulate a different narrative that has the, will have the effect of undermining a lot of the core principles. So um, I will just say for those of you on, on this call, thank you for supporting the, the Independent Institute. Um, you are, y your support is absolutely critical for the Institute to continue its mission, which is good, but more importantly than that, to make sure that these issues and values and principles are part of this public discourse. Um, right. Without your support, it, it frankly wouldn't be happening. And I've been, I founded my first think tank in 19, free market think tank in 1989. So it's, uh, I, this is, the, I, the Independent Institute is, in a, and is an amazing force for this. And so um, the more we can do to support them, and I will do that through my writing and contributions, but um, through your support, direct support, it's making a difference. An important yeah, difference. You are so right. And, you know, the, the folks who stand with us, both our supporters uh, financially as well as our scholars, understand that the Bill of Rights and law and order are really the two sides of the same coin. They, they stand or fall together. So, again, um, thanks everybody on the call. 
uh, let me remind you that you can always go to our website, uh, independent.org, uh, to find the latest resources on this and related subjects. We also have a number of uh, issues on the COVID crisis, which are illuminating. Um, watch for more writings by Dr. Sam Staley on our website. And of course, at the top right of our website, there's a donate button, which you can always use. And <laughs> We're thankful when you do. Uh, and let's just say goodbye and a final thanks to Dr. Sam Staley. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Sam, and thanks everybody for being with us here at the Independent Institute.